Hello, this is Jonathan Eisen. Uh, I'm from the University of California in Davis, and today I'm going to be talking about phylogenomic case studies, uh, the benefits, and I might mention a few times the occasional drawbacks of integrating evolutionary and genomic studies. I am uh, really sad not to be in person at the meeting. Um, I was really looking forward to going to St. Petersburg. Hopefully I can go to the next one uh, that's there. Um, but in the meantime, I'm recording this talk in Davis, California, where it is about 115 degrees Fahrenheit outside today. So it's nice to be inside. Um, but again, longing to be actually in St. Petersburg. So um, I will try to mention the people that do a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about, um, but I just thought I would show this slide. That's a relatively recent picture of many of the people in my lab um, and uh, a list of the people in the lab um, that have been there for the last uh, 10 or so years. What I'm going to talk about today is um, broadly some of the work done in my lab, um, the research that we work on, and then uh, focus in for this um, conference in particular on the bioinformatics methods and approaches and resources that we've been working on in the course of doing our work. In terms of what I'm actually interested in, it's, it's quite broad. What I generally refer to it as evolvability or the integration of phylogenomics and evolvability, and I'm going to walk you through a little bit of what uh, that means here. So basically, in terms of evolve evolvability, what I'm really interested in is where do where does novelty come from? Where do new functions, new processes, and other new features come from? And in the simplest sense, you can build an evolutionary tree of organisms and ask where along this evolutionary tree do these new processes originate? And in a cartoon form. Basically, imagine you have some common ancestor of all these lineages here, has some trait, let's just draw it as the red circle. And over the course of evolution, this branch, um, nothing changed in terms of that particular trait. So the descendants inherit the red circle. This branch and this branch here, same thing. But somewhere along this branch, there was a change to another trait, which we're going to represent with the green circle here. Um, and that um, is basically sort of the cartoon representation of the origin of novelty. And what I was interested in for many years was um, how organisms um, originated novelty from within uh, their own organism, within their genome. That is what I refer to as intrinsic processes, things like mutation and duplication and deletion and uh, chromosome rearrangements and recombination. And I spent a lot of time working on these, the origin of novelty in the context of these particular processes. And what I was mostly interested in, and this is why I call it evolvability, was why is there variation in these particular processes, both within and between taxa? And the phylogenomics component came in with trying to make use of genomic data and evolutionary studies, that's the phylogenomics term, to interpret and predict the evolvability of organisms. And um, over time, I continued to work on this, but I began to grow interested in um, some alternatives. And um, what I became interested in, in particular was how organisms acquired novelty, not from intrinsic processes, but from the outside, from extrinsic um, sources. So the simplest uh, example of this would be something on the order of you have this organism, it evolved this trait, again, which we're representing by the green circle. And then this organism over here, not a particularly close relative um, of that organism, acquires this trait by either recombination, if it's, say, within a species, or by lateral gene transfer, if it's between species. So this is now. The process was originated actually in a different group, 
And this organism down here is in essence stealing it from this other organism via gene transfer. And I worked on that for a few years and still I'm interested in it, but I began to grow more and more interested in other extrinsic processes that could lead to the origin of novelty. And again, in, the, in this context, I was still interested in what led to differences in gene transfer and recombination processes between species. But what I became interested in was um, a different type of extrinsic interaction where um, what was going on was not a transfer of genes, but an interaction between organisms, some type of symbiosis. If it's between a couple of organisms, or I guess you could call it symbioses, if it's many organisms, or um, now a lot of the work that we do in my lab is on microbiomes as communities of organisms that interact either with each other or with another organism. And again, what I'm most interested in here is how do these symbioses or communities of organisms lead to the origin of new functions and new processes? And again, what leads to differences and similarities in those processes? Um, and the rates and patterns by which they occur within and between species. So in terms of the major sort of types of work that we do, um, I've made a little sort of outline here, um, Venn diagram or not quite a Venn diagram of it, and I'm gonna walk you through that here. So again, the main thing I'm interested in is phylogenomics, and evolvability, mostly in microbes, although not always in microbes. Um, and in essence, I imagine or I think of the work we do having four different major um, areas of emphasis. There are the research projects that we carry out. That is, what scientific questions are we asking? What are our study systems? What are we trying to collect data on? Um, there are methods and tools that we work on developing that I call phylogenomic methods and tools. There's resources and reference data that we try to collect or help others collect. And then we spend a lot of time thinking about communication and participation in microbiology and science. And these all connect to each other, although I haven't drawn them as overlapping, but we develop phylogeno phylogenomic methods and tools that are related to our research projects. We develop resources that are related to our projects. And we develop tools that try to help analyze the resources that we develop and we communicate about things. We do citizen science projects and other such things and other outreach that are all connected in some way to our resources or our research projects or the origin of novelty. What I'm gonna focus on uh, at the beginning here is to just walk you through a sort of tour of the research projects, the topic areas that we have worked on. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. This really is just a tour to give you a taste of the topics that we work on. Um, so for example, in intrinsic novelty studies, um, uh, we've done some work on and off, mostly earlier, but still interested in this on the generation of novelty via recombination or how recombination impacts the origin of novelty. And I originally got interested in this as a graduate student um, when we were looking at structure function relationships in um, the Rec A protein in bacteria. This is the gene, the protein that's involved in regulating homologous recombination. And I got interested in analysis of sequence data to interpret the structure function studies and the mutation studies that we were doing. So I um, started to try and find uh, where there were other Rec A sequences outside of E. coli. Um, we wanted to do recombination studies in a variety of diverse organisms that hadn't been looked at. So I designed degenerate PCR primers to clone out Rec A genes from a variety of species. Um, this worked most of the time, but interestingly, even though we thought at the time that Rec A was a housekeeping gene and was required in all organisms, there are some organisms, in particular intracellular pathogens and symbionts that are missing Rec A, but most bacteria, most archaea, most eukaryotes have a homolog of Rec A. It's only occasionally missing, but when it is missing, it has massive impacts on the evolution and the origin of novelty in those organisms because they those orga organisms basically have no homologous recombination. Um, another 
research area that I've worked on in terms of intrinsic novelty is chromosome rearrangements. We did a lot of work um, when the first genome sequences were coming out, looking at patterns of conserved gene order between taxa and noticed some interesting patterns. And in particular, the thing that we noticed was that one of the most common um, forms of chromosome rearrangement in bacteria and archaea were inversions that occurred symmetric about the origin of replication. Um, and if you have many of these that occur over you know, some evolutionary time, you start to get this interesting pattern where a dot plot alignment of two genomes will look like an X rather than a straight line. And that's what's shown in some of these figures here. You start to see this X-like pattern. We call this the X files for that particular reason. Um, also been greatly interested in duplication processes across lots of organisms. We've um, looked at this in a lot of taxa. One organism that we worked on with really unusual patterns for duplication was tetrahymena, a ciliate. Tetrahymena and other ciliates have this interesting um, system where they have a macronucleus and a micronucleus containing their genomes. The micronucleus basically is the equivalent to a germ cell nucleus. The macronucleus is sort of the equivalent to somatic cells. And um, after sexual reproduction, there are interesting rearrangement processes that go on for the micronucleus to generate the macronucleus. And one of these processes leads to the suppression of um, some types of duplication within tetrahymena. So I was very interested in this. Also done a lot of work on extrinsic novelty generation. Again, I'm just going to walk you through a couple of the examples here. Definitely um, been very interested in the mechanisms and the what causes differences within and between species in the rates and patterns of gene transfer. Lateral gene transfer is an incredibly important process in lots of taxa, probably more important in bacteria and some archaea than it is in say, multicellular eukaryotes, but it still occurs across lots of taxa and has profound implications for evolution, for phylogeny, for biology. Lots of interesting and important processes are um, impacted by lateral gene transfer. Um, and we've worked on this in a variety of taxa, including um, Wolbachia, including Arabidopsis, including humans, including a variety of bacterial species. There's just Lots of interesting things going on, lots of weird things going on in terms of gene transfer across taxa. And then the thing that I've been working on mostly for the last 15 years has been a novelty generated by symbioses, um, either one organism with another organism or two organisms with another organism, or as I mentioned, um, communities of organisms, that is microbiomes with other taxa. And in terms of this, the thing that I'm mostly working on these days is what I call this triangle, the host microbe stress triangle, where you have some host, some microbe that is associated with the host, and then some stress that they are placed under. And how does the host and how do the host and microbe respond to the stress and or a community of microbes? How does the microbiome respond to the stress and how do the host and microbe impact how the other responds to the stress? And so um, when organisms are put under this selective pressure, what I'm interested in is in what cases are the interactions, the symbioses, the microbiomes, a important component of how the organism responds to the stress? And can we manipulate those interactions um, or force new ones upon systems to impact how they respond to stress? So I'm just going to walk you through, again, a few examples of this. Um, in our research topics. So one general area that we've been very interested in is nutrient acquisition and the interaction between host and microbes or microbiomes and how the host in particular, but also the microbes acquire nutrients. One that I've been working on actually since I was an undergraduate and still doing work in this area is with chemosynthetic symbioses. Um, my undergraduate advisor was Colleen Kavanaugh who discovered co-discovered the symbiosis between giant tube worms and chemosynthetic bacteria and hydrothermal vents, and also discovered that there are many other systems on the planet where um, there's a host animal that um, no longer acquires its carbon or its food basically by eating, but has symbionts that synthesize sugars for it. Um, in essence, the animals are functioning like plants. It's very interesting, very weird, and there's um, lots and lots and lots of examples of this 
chemosynthetic symbiosis throughout the tree of life, throughout the ecosystems on the planet. Also done work on other types of nutrient acquisition. So for example, we had a collaboration with Nancy Moran on studying the glassy wing sharpshooter as a model for xylem feeding organisms. A bunch of arthropods are obligate xylem feeders. Xylem is one of the two circulatory systems in plants. It's very nutrient poor and organisms that obligately live off of xylem um, have to have a lot of adaptations in order to acquire their nutrients. And in many of them, they have intracellular symbionts that make some of the nutrients that they're missing from xylem fluid. And that's what we've worked on with Nancy was sequencing the genomes of some of the sharpshooter symbionts. We've also worked on nitrogen acquisition in various land plants. And looks like there are some land plants that are able to, uh, even without rhizobia fixing nitrogen for them, like you see in legumes, there are some land plants that can have associations with microbes that help them acquire nitrogen from the environment. A second type of host microbe stress interaction that I'm very interested in is when the stress is a pathogen. Um, so we've done work on uh, flu infections in ducks in collaboration with Walter Boyce and others, um, and how the microbiome may or may not impact the flu susceptibility or severity. Had a graduate student, Katie Dalhausen, working on um, the interaction between koalas, their gut microbiome, and chlamydia or treatments for chlamydia with antibiotics. Um, and I have two current graduate students working on the chytrid infections in frogs, this incredibly severe fungal pathogen that is decimating amphibian populations throughout the globe. It looks like the skin microbiome in amphibians can impact the probability that the chytrid actually takes hold and the severity of the infection. So that's what Sonia Ghosh and Marina De Leon are, have been working on. And then the last general area of the HMS triangle that I'm interested in is um, when the environment changes, places a stress on organisms, how do the host and microbiome interactions impact that response to such stresses? Well, one example of environmental change is domestication. So we've done work in collaboration with um, the Sundar lab on rice domestication and the microbiome. We've had multiple projects and still have multiple projects relating to um, seagrasses they're really interesting because they have uh in the their ancient past they were terrestrial plants or aquatic plants and then they moved back into the marine environment had to acquire a lot of adaptations to surviving in salt water and in tidal areas and in the marine environment and we're interested in what the impact is of the microbiome on those adaptations and on the biology of seagrass and uh, the latest project that we're working on in this general area is a collaboration with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute on the rise of the Panamanian Isthmus and how this has um, led to speciation events in thousands upon thousands of taxa that are now isolated on the two sides, in the Atlantic versus the Pacific. And what is the impact of that on their microbiomes and what is the impact of the microbiomes of those organisms on how they've been affected by the rise of the Panamanian Isthmus. So that's just like this brief tour. I just wanted to give you some context, um, but that's the end of the tour now. And what I wanna do is talk about these other areas um, that we work on in my lab without focusing explicitly on sort of specific um, model systems or systems that we work on. And what I really wanna talk about, because this is a bioinformatics conference, is our phylogenomic methods and tools development and our phylogenomic resources and reference data. So that's what I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk on here. So I'm gonna just start with some discussion of phylogenomic methods and tools that we have worked on over the years. And the emphasis here um, and throughout is gonna be sort of related to the title of my talk, which is why should we integrate evolutionary and genomic analyses or really actually even simpler than that, why does a phylogenetic perspective help in methods and tool development for say, analyzing sequence data or analyzing other similar types of data? What is it about um, phylogeny in per particular that is understanding the relationships among genes, the relationships among organisms and their evolutionary history that can be helpful? So I'm gonna walk you through a couple of examples of this. The first, is sort of one of the, the broadest areas that a lot of people work on with 
um, sequence analysis for microbes and microbial communities, which is analysis of ribosomal RNA sequence data. Ribosomal RNA has become one of the sort of markers of choice to look at for studying microbial diversity, for studying microbiomes, for studying individual microbes in some cases. And this is largely because it's relatively cheap and easy to um, sequence from particular ecosystems. And there's also just massive databases of sequence data. So this started back in the 1980s um, with people starting to sequence ribosomal RNA genes from environments. And it has continued today with people still doing this from environmental samples. In fact, I started working on this in the late 1980s when I was an undergrad in Colleen Cavanaugh's lab. And I got a paper out of sequencing a single ribosomal RNA sequence from one collection of bacteria that lived inside one clam species. Um, today, of course, you can sequence billions of ribosomal RNA sequences with Illumina sequencing or with some other sequencing method in a few hours um, from an entire community. But back then, you know, a single sequence was a pretty big achievement. Um, and what I got interested in at the time was how we would analyze this, this sequence data, and in particular, how and why phylogenetic analyses of the sequence data were useful. And so we've developed a lot of tools over the years to help people do this or to help ourselves do this. Um, and the key point here uh, that I want to emphasize is similarity. That is, if you measure, for example, the similarity between two ribosomal RNA sequences by a blast search or by an alignment or by some um, hash-based method or some other thing, that is not the same thing as looking at relatedness. It's not the same thing as looking building an evolutionary tree. And it's, in many cases, way quicker, but not as good as building an evolutionary tree and using the evolutionary tree to interpret your results. So we've built tools to do this. I mean, this is um, something from many years ago now called STAP, the small subunit taxonomy and alignment pipeline that Don Ying Wu and Amber Hartman in my lab developed, sort of one of the first automated methods for inferring phylogenetic trees of sequence data as next gen sequencing was starting to come out for ribosome RNA. We applied this to many different situations, including um, one of the first metagenomic studies that was done by Craig Venter for, of the Sargasso Sea. And we showed that you could use this not just for PCR amplified sequence data, but for sequences that were coming from random samples with metagenomes. Um, Amber went on to develop another method, another automated method called Waters um, in, in this particular workflow system. Um, we had a collaboration with Katie Pollard and Jessica Green and Tom Sharpton. And Tom developed a tool for um, doing something that most people at the time didn't do, and I still don't think many people do, which is um, many people at the time were trying to clump together ribosome RNA sequences into operational taxonomic units, that is OTUs, that is a set of sequences that are basically closely related enough that we're going to call them roughly the same thing. People also do this now with other methods like looking for ASVs and such. Um, same general idea, you try to find a cluster of things that are so similar to each other that they might roughly represent the same taxon. It turns out that um, similarity scores, like percent identity cutoffs for OTUs, make some mistakes in clustering sequences that can be corrected if you build an evolutionary tree of sequences. Um, and that's what Tom's method did. It's building evolutionary trees to identify OTUs rather than looking at just percent similarity. Another really useful um, part of phylogenetic analysis for ribosome RNA is that um, if you wanna estimate the relative abundance of taxa from the relative abundance of ribosome RNA sequences in a particular data set, uh, it turns out that you need to do some corrections because different taxa have different numbers of copies of ribosome RNA genes. And if you don't account for that, you're gonna um, make inaccurate estimates of the relative abundance based upon the number of hits you get to particular ribosome RNA sequences. And so Stephen Kemble, um, who was a postdoc in Jessica Green's lab, and Martin Wu, who was in my lab, um, worked on this method for using the phylogenetic tree of taxa and information about copy number from known organisms to then build a correction for unknown organisms unknown taxa that you didn't know how many copies they had of the ribosome RNA, but you could predict how many copies they had based on where they sat 
in the evolutionary tree compared to taxa for which we knew the copy number. And although we still do stuff with ribosome RNA, I um, got very interested early on in how we could use other marker genes for looking at organisms from environmental samples. And this spun off originally from my work on RecA. So as I mentioned before, I was interested in RecA structure function studies. Um, I downloaded at the time all 65 of the RecA sequences that were available from different taxa and showed that an evolutionary tree of those RecAs was very, very similar to the evolutionary tree of ribosome RNA sequences and sort of became convinced that we should, we could use RecA as a phylogenetic marker in, in addition to ribosome RNA. And you can do this certainly from cultured organisms. You can do PCR amplification from cultured organisms or genetics or other types of cloning. And that's what we did. And we got new sequences and showed that they could be useful markers for phylogeny. But from environmental samples at the time, degenerate PCR, even with a conserved protein like RecA, the degenerate PCR just did not work very well from environmental samples. Fortunately, along came metagenomics. And now you had this opportunity to get sequences of genes that were not um, ribosomal RNA from environmental samples. You could get any sequence, including RecA. Um, and so again, in the Venter Sargasso C study, I showed that you could um, use RecA as your marker for phylotyping from environmental samples. And in fact, it gave somewhat similar results to what you got with ribosomal RNA. And I went through this data set. Um, I'm just gonna skip over that. I went through um, and made a list of uh, six marker genes to look at, uh, five protein sequences, elongation factor two, RecA, HSP70, RPOB, and uh, ribosomal protein, um, and then ribosome RNA, and showed that, in fact, these not only worked really well for doing phylogenetic analysis of uncultured organisms, but they, in fact, um, in some cases, worked better than ribosome RNA because the copy number variation was very low between taxa for these genes, unlike for ribosomal RNA. Um, so uh, Martin Wu in my lab developed an automated pipeline for doing this from environmental samples called Amphora. That was a hidden Markov model-based method. He also, um, as I will mention later, used this same pipeline for building whole genome trees of cultured organisms, but it also worked for environmental samples and you could rapidly classify all these sets of marker genes from environmental samples um, with these protein coding genes and complement or sometimes improve upon ribosomal RNA analysis. Um, Aaron Darling, when he was in my lab as a postdoc, uh, extended this um, method in essence and built a tool called Phylosift, which is a much more detailed phylogenetic analysis of environmental sequences using the hidden Markov model general approach and collaborated with Eric Matson to add in a placement algorithm so that you could have much more rapid placement of sequences by pre-computing phylogenetic trees and then using this pplacer algorithm to place new sequences into existing phylogenetic trees for those particular sequences. And then using methods like edge PCA to analyze environmental samples using the phylogenetic trees of each of these marker genes. Um, and it turns out that using other marker genes from environmental samples is very useful for getting estimates of not just who is there, but also the phylogenetic diversity of the sample and the beta diversity of the sample um, and so on. Stephen Kemble developed this method for doing this doing PD calculations, that is phylogenetic diversity from metagenomes using these marker genes. Um, there's all sorts of other things we've developed in my lab. I'm not gonna talk about all of them now. Um, this is sort of a side story, which is if you wanna use lots of marker genes in a rapid way, um, in some cases, the alignments that you're making of them are not particularly good or have regions that are ambiguous. And Martin Wu and Sir Shatterjee in my lab developed an automated method for estimating the regions of alignment uncertainty so that you could mask out regions from the alignment without any type of manual curation. So a second area of um, tool development that I'd like to mention or tool use, I guess it's less development than use and showing how it could be used is in um, phylogenomic functional prediction. So, um, the key point here is that to understand how functions evolve, we need to be able to predict 
functions really well from sequence data. And I'm just going to walk you through the story which led to me to develop this sort of general approach, um, which is um, when I was a graduate student back in 1997, Tiger, the Institute for Genomic Research, published a paper on the complete genome of Helicobacter pylori, the causative agent of stomach ulcers. Um, and I noticed this really interesting line in the paper that they said the ability of Helicobacter pylori to perform mismatch repair is suggested by the presence of these methyltransferases, MUDAS, and UVRD. And I noticed this interesting line. However, orthologs of MUDH and MUDAL were not identified. And I, this was really interesting to me because at the time I was working on intrinsic evolvability and mismatch repair. And what mismatch repair is, is process by which organisms correct mistakes made during DNA replication by scanning the newly replicated DNA for mismatches compared to the old DNA. And then if there are mismatches, removing a section of the newly replicated DNA and re-replicating it. Um, and lots of organisms had been shown to have this, E. coli, B. subtilis, yeast, humans, Arabidopsis, and so on at the time. And in every case, whenever an organism had this process, they had homologs of these two genes, MUDAL and MUDAS. So it was really interesting that they reported that Helicobacter pylori did not have MUDAL, even though it had MUDAS. And I, this struck me as somewhat weird and somewhat unusual. To make a long story short, I went and looked at the data in more detail with first blast and then with phylogenetic trees. And the key thing here, again, repeating a public service announcement, similarity is not the same thing as relatedness. If you get beyond the blast search and you look at an evolutionary tree, what I saw at the time was there were two parts of the evolutionary tree, basically. The ones showing in red here are genes that were in a variety of organisms that were known to be involved in mismatch repair. And the ones over here in blue were genes that were homologous to MUDAS, but were not involved in mismatch repair or involved in chromosome segregation. And um, what was really interesting to me was the Helicobacter pylori gene was in this subfamily with other bacterial and archaeal sequences for which nobody had ever studied the function of any of the genes in this subfamily. And here are the normal bacterial MUDASs over here. So this to me said, well, wait, we don't want to predict that a gene in this subgroup is involved in mismatch repair when it's not in the same, you know, nothing's been studied in this subgroup and it's actually most closely related to things that are not involved in mismatch repair. Um, so actually it turned out um, Helicobacter pylori does not appear to have mismatch repair, which is what I predicted from that analysis. And eventually I developed a general approach to using phylogenetic trees to predict functions of genes. I didn't develop any software for doing this. It was just a conceptual approach. And I did this by hand myself. Other people later developed software for doing this. But the general idea was that you would take a sequence, search it against a database, find homologs, build an evolutionary tree of those homologs, and then overlay onto that evolutionary tree experimentally determined functions, and then use evolutionary character state reconstruction methods like you would use with dinosaur fossils or with bird wings or something like that, um, and um, predict the function of things that had been uncharacterized by where they sat in the evolutionary tree and what the most likely model was for the transition states between functions in that evolutionary tree. And I called this phylogenomics, for better or worse. Um, I coined a new word and called it phylogenomics, and it's been with me ever since. I note this is not like conceptually particularly crazy or particularly novel. This is exactly what people had been doing, including myself, but many people before me, with building evolutionary trees of ribosomal RNA genes for uncultured organisms like this chemosynthetic symbiont of the clam, and then trying to predict the function of those organisms based on where they sat in an evolutionary tree compared to other organisms that had been studied. So all I did here was repri replace this concept of the organism and the unknown organism with the gene and the unknown gene. And you can apply this to any type of gene family from any type of environment. And as long as you overlay experimentally determined functions onto the tree, you can use a phylogenetic approach to make predictions of functions of unknown genes. You can do this for metagenomic samples. You can do this um, as Tom Sharpton developed later in a sort of high throughput manner from metagenomic samples. And you can, lots of people have developed methods for doing this. I think it generally improves your ability to predict function for uncharacterized genes. But it's limited. 
it's even today, it's still imperfectly automated in my mind. Every gene family is different. Every function is different. And in some cases, this is really important. This is one of the big caveats with phylogenetic methods. Function doesn't always track with phylogeny well. Sometimes function tracks just with single amino acid changes in some conserved binding region like um, of a protein, like this is what's seen with rhodopsins and the retinal binding region of rhodopsins. Function sometimes tracks really well with phylogeny and you can then predict the function of uncharacterized genes by their phylogenetic position. But in other cases, function works, tracks much better with looking at particular mutations. This is true of the spike protein, for example, with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and this doesn't work at all if no members of a gene family have been characterized. No evolutionary tree is going to help you if you can't overlay any functions onto that tree. It doesn't give you any additional information. But there are a whole suite of tools that you can use to predict functions for genes, even when no members of a gene family have been characterized. And these have generally been referred to as non-homology functional prediction methods. And we've worked on these a little bit in my lab over time. And what I want to show you is really an example of one of them that we've used, phylogenetic profiling. We didn't invent this method. We just used it. But I just want to show you at the end how phylogeny can be particularly helpful here. So the example I'm going to tell you about involves this organism, Carboxidothermus hydrogenoformans. The details are, aren't exceptionally important, but it's a member of the Firmicutes phylum. It, that's also known as the low GC gram positives group. Um, we sequenced the genome when I was a tiger, um, and we were collaborating with this person at University of Maryland, Frank Robb. We noticed when we sequenced the genome that it had homologs of all the sporulation genes that had been found in other firmicutes like Bacillus anthracis. Um, and that was interesting because Frank had tried to get this organism to sporulate and was never able to do it. Once we found the genes in the genome, he went back and was able to get the organism to form the traditional uh, endospores seen in other firmicutes, again, like anthrax and other Bacillus subtilis and other organisms in the group. That's not what I really want to tell you about. What I want to tell you about is then we ran this phylogenetic profiling analysis, a method developed by um, Pellegrini and Kunin and a variety of other people, where you basically search your genes against the organisms of interest. You ask yes or no, is my gene found in each of these other species? So genes and rows, species and columns here. And you cluster genes by their distribution patterns across taxa, not by whether or not they have homologs that have been experimentally characterized. And then you look at those clusters and you see if there are genes of unknown function that are found in the same set of taxa as genes of known function that might help you predict their function. And we found them here um, uh, with carboxidothermus. There were many genes that had very, very similar distribution patterns to the sporulation proteins, but for which we couldn't predict any function based upon sequence analysis alone that were called conserved hypothetical protein or something like that. We then collaborated with Rich Lozick and Bjorn Trag and other people in Rich Lozick's lab. He worked on sporulation in B. subtilis and he showed basically that every single one of these genes that showed that distribution pattern was in fact involved in sporulation. This is an incredibly powerful tool for predicting the function of uncharacterized genes. As we get more and more genomes, it gets better and better. Um, it's just everybody should be using this if you want to find and predict functions of uncharacterized genes. But the key point I want to make here is that when you do this functional prediction, most people, when they look for presence and absence of homologs of genes, just do just that. They basically ask, is there a blast match for my gene of interest? It turns out it's much better to make better functional predictions if you ask yes, no, is there a close relative of my gene or is there an ortholog of my gene of interest rather than just is there a homolog of my gene of interest. You can do the same type of thing for metagenomes. It's a little bit harder, obviously, because you don't um, necessarily know which organisms are present in the sample. If you bin the metagenomes, it works a little bit better than doing unbin data. Another key thing for doing um, this type of analysis is to build um, whole genome trees, whole genome phylogeny, and basically to understand how functions evolve, we want to know how organisms are related to each other. And it turns out the whole genome is a very useful tool for inferring this. And just to give you an example, there are many of these out there. This is one that came from work done um, by Naomi Ward and Jonathan Badger that I collaborated with. Naomi and Jonathan were analyzing the genome of um, Hyphomonas, 
Hyphomonas neptunium. And in the ribosomal RNA tree of this organism and in its original classification, it was described as a member of the Rhodobacteriales group because it, phylogenetically it was a member of this group. When we analyzed the genome and built whole genome trees of Hyphomonas, it actually appears to be a sister to Colobacter and in the Colobacteriales group, not in the Rhodobacteriales group. And it looks like in this case, the 16S ribosomal RNA gene that was used for this phylogeny is just misleading. It's either been acquired by lateral gene transfer or undergone convergent evolution or some other weird thing going on. Whereas the whole genome and many of the individual genes in the genome other than the 16S ribosome RNA tell us what the actual phylogeny of this organism is. And so um, in many studies that we've done, we've use genome analysis, whole genome trees to better interpret the biology that we're looking at. So if we go to this um, glassy winged uh, sharpshooter story, um, the symbionts of these sharpshooters that are trying to live the, on xylem fluid. Um, here's one of the symbionts, Baumania cicatolinicola. And like uh, if you build a whole genome tree of a bunch of symbionts and their relatives, you see this standard pattern, which is seen for basically all intracellular organisms, symbionts and pathogens. That is the evolutionary branch lengths are longer for these taxa than in free living relatives. The evolutionary rates in intracellular organisms tend to be higher than in free living organisms. And whole genome trees are a great way to characterize this. Really interestingly, and from my point of view, probably more interesting is that there are two taxa here in this endosymbiont tree um, that have really, really long branches compared to even the other endosymbionts. And these are the taxa in this group that are missing the DNA mismatch repair genes in their genome. So most likely what's going on here is that their evolutionary rate has accelerated because they lost the genes that are involved in repairing mismatches and therefore have a higher mutation rate and that's what's leading to their higher evolutionary rate. And again, you need whole genome trees to really do this well and to do this in a simple manner. To do this um, in a high throughput manner, you need you know, sort of better methods to build whole genome trees. And many people in my lab over the years have worked on the methods for doing this. Um, we're not probably even remotely the top leaders in this area. There are of course hundreds of groups that have worked on whole genome trees and the methods to do this, but we've done it also. Jenna Lang in my lab applied a Bayesian uh, method for trying to do this with a super tree approach. Uh, Martin did this with his Amphora package. Aaron did this with his Phylosift package. And we continue to sort of work on methods for building whole genome trees. And again, there are other people that have sort of developed this uh, better than us. Uh, Don Ying Wu in my lab developed a method that turns out to be really useful, I think, which is um, when you build trees of individual genes, um, the branch lengths in different parts of the tree can vary. And if you want to be able to compare multiple genes to each other or compare different parts of the tree to each other, it's really helpful to normalize the branch lengths across the tree by doing some type of weighting. And that's what he did with this tree OTU method. Um, another really important thing to do is to try and link phylogeny and function. Um, in environmental samples in particular, when you have a genome of an organism, the phylogeny and function are linked because you have one organism and you have the whole genome of that organism. And now you can build a whole genome tree and you can figure out the phylogeny and then you can look at the function experimentally or bioinformatically and they're linked to each other. But if we go to environmental samples, which is what a lot of people are doing and where a lot of data is coming from, um, and we do things like metagenomics, the main way that you would be able to link um, function and phylogeny from those environmental samples is to build assemblies of the genomes from those environmental samples. And then now you can treat, if you get a really good assembly from the environmental sample, you can treat everything like you would a genome from a cultured organism. And we've worked on sort of laboratory methods for doing this in my lab, like high C metagenomic binning and using long reads. But I just wanna emphasize something from a while ago actually, which is it turns out that phylogenetic trees of sequences are an incredibly useful tool for improving your ability to bin read data or contig data from environmental samples. And this came from that sharpshooter study. Basically, it turns out there were two symbionts in the sample that we looked at. When we did shotgun sequencing and assembly, we assembled the genome of this Baumania organism 
pretty well, um, but we got only a tiny bit of sequence data from this Solcia organism. But the way we figured out which pieces of the data came from Solcia as opposed to from other things in our sample was to build evolutionary trees of each of the sequences in the sample. Here's one, Solcia is from the Bacteroides group. So this sequence from our sample most likely is from the Bacteroides group. Even without binning, you can say that this sequence likely comes from a member of the Bacteroides group. And in our case, we were lucky there was only one member of the Bacteroides group in our sample. So we could assign this to that particular organism. Okay, so um, I wanna switch and uh, for the last parts of the talk, talk about phylogenomic resources and reference data. Um, and again, using phylogeny as a tool to guide the generation of this reference data in particular. So the first thing I wanna talk about is filling in genomes from across the tree of life. So as in 2002, this is what our model of the tree of life looked like. Um, this was before the Loki Archaea revolutionized I, our idea of eukaryotic evolution and how eukaryotes may actually be a subgroup of Archaea, but we'll ignore that for now here. The points still hold. Here is a tree with lots of diversity, but across the tree of life, most of the genomes were coming from only a few of the branches at the time. When I was a tiger before moving to Davis, we got an NSF grant to fill in the tree of life that you know we thought at the time it was really filling it in. We got um, we sequenced seven genomes from across the tree of bacteria for which there were cultured species, um, but no genomes in those phyla. And then when I moved to UC Davis, I had an adjunct appointment at the Joint Genome Institute. Um, collaborated with many people there, including Ala Lapidus, who invited me to give uh, this talk here. Um, and um, we developed a project called the Genomic Encyclopedia of Bacteria and Archaea, which was basically like this Tree of Life project that we had done on steroids. And the idea was to just march our way through the tree of Bacteria and Archaea and find any branch for which there was a cultured organism and no genome in that branch and sequence the genome. And we showed when we did this, that this was an incredibly powerful approach for discovering new protein families. So um, one example here is how these genomes can be used to provide context for studies even in other systems. If it's a study of humans and their microbiomes um, that showed that westernized populations appeared to be missing um, representatives of this spirochete clade found in hunter-gatherer populations, um, and those spirochetes were closely related to some that we had sequenced as part of this genomic encyclopedia project, and this allowed them to make predictions about their biology and function. There have been many spin-off projects for this, not just filling in the tree of all bacteria and archaea, but there's been a Giba cyanobacteria project, there's been a halo archaea Giba project, there's been many of these. And basically the point is that you can walk your way through the tree of any group and fill select organisms for sequencing based upon their phylogenetic novelty in the group. And that's very powerful. The one big limitation of this is originally this only worked for cultured organisms and most of the diversity of life is found in the dark matter, so-called dark matter of biology is in the uncultured organisms from across the tree of life. And so there've been many subsequent projects where people have tried to generate genomes from branches that no one has ever cultured. One way to do this uh, was done at JGI in a project led by Tanya Wojcicki um, and Ramona Stefanoskis um, at the Bigelow Labs, which was to do single cell sorting and sequence genomes from the single cell sorts. There's a second project also involving Tanya and Ramona and a few other people um, to continue to do that single cell sorting approach to fill in um, the dark matter. But you can also do now get decent genomes by metagenomics and assembling the genomes and getting mags. And much of the tree of life is being filled in by this approach rather than by flow sorting single cell genomes or cultured organism genomes. It's still very powerful to focus on the novel branches when you do that. Um, the same is true for protein families. So just like it is true to fill in the tree um, for organisms, it's also really useful to organize all protein families into, in essence, a tree, and then to focus some of your analyses, your biochemistry, your structural biology, your um, genetics, your whatever you're doing 
on the different families that are determined by um, by sort of a global clustering phylogenetic analysis of all protein family space. And then another really important area is this can all feed back back into your ability to analyze environmental data by taking the genomes that you have generated by from cultured organisms or from single cells or from mags and use them to identify which genes are robust, reliable phylogenetic markers from those organisms. This was done by Don Ying Wu in my group. And you can do things like ask which genes have uh, even copy number across those taxa, which genes are present across all those taxa, which genes are easy to align across all those taxa, which genes build evolutionary trees readily that are monophyletic across those taxa. And we've built lists, other people have built lists, and now you can go through and say, I'm not just gonna look at 30 marker genes for all taxa. If I have firmicutes in my sample, there are actually 106 genes uh, sorry, 87 uh, genes in this group that are very useful as markers for firmicutes. There were 590 that were very useful as markers for cyanobacteria. And you can now analyze a higher percentage of metagenomic data or genomic data based upon these phylum-specific marker gene sets. So um, basically what I've tried to do here is to just provide a perspective that you know, in the simplest form, you can cross out anything you've heard, ignore all of it, and think about phylogenetic trees matter. Similarity, measuring similarity between two sequences or between two organisms is not sufficient because, um, and I didn't mention this when I talked about functional prediction, but the reason that similarity is not sufficient is that organisms can evolve at different rates. And if one lineage in a particular group evolves at a different rate than the other lineages, then your measures of similarity will be misleading as to the evolutionary relatedness of the organisms or genes in your group. And therefore, it is better to use a phylogenetic approach that tries to account for different rates of evolution in different groups rather than mathematically robust similarity approaches, which might not account for different rates. Um, in different groups. And so everything I've talked about is basically using phylogeny as a tool to improve your ability to analyze genome data or sequence data or uh, organism information. Um, and as I said before, one of the other things that I work on a lot is communication and participation in microbiology and science. I'm not going to talk about that actually at all today. Um, but I hope people there think about it, get engaged in your community, communicate about microbiology, um, bioinformatics, genomics more. We need it a lot right now. There's um, obviously a lot of interest in such things due to SARS-CoV-2, and it will continue to be an interest. So I encourage everybody to get more engaged with um, the broader community and your local community. Um, so going back to this uh, lab topics, the organization of everything I'm interested in is how new processes and functions evolve, and in particular, what causes differences in the probability that they're going to evolve in one lineage or another? What leads to those differences, and how can we better predict from genome data how an organism might evolve in the future or how it might have evolved in the past? And I walked you through this tour of the research projects and then talked a little bit about methods and tools and resources and reference data, and um, alas, did not have time to talk about communication and participation in microbiology and science. And I will end there with this recent picture from many of the people in my lab, and thank you for listening.